Lelouch of the Resurrection came out in 2019. Before the dark times as the sequel to Glorification. For those unfamiliar, Glorification is part of a trilogy of three films that tell an alternate version of the original anime, with the other two being Initiation and Transgression. This timeline is actually one of three that follow the original story, a topic for another time. There are more pressing matters. Very well, I catch your drift. Resurrection had mixed reviews, with many criticizing the film's appeal to nostalgia through fan service. Not me, though. That was one of the best parts of the film. This film served as one last ride with our favorite characters from the past. Unless, of course, they show up in Z of the Recapture whenever that's coming out. The crazy part is you don't realize just how many references appear in this film. Some were interesting, while others were just simple nostalgia bait. Don't believe me? You're lying, aren't you? Well, let's find out together as I go over 70 references from Lelouch of the Resurrection that, let's be honest, you probably missed. Hey! Are you listening? Before we start, spoiler alert for anything Kogias related. Hmm, that's tastelessly obvious. Number 70. It's been a while, everyone. After that interesting imagery to start the film, Colin greets the audience with the following lines. These lines can refer to two different things. The first is that if you consider that Naato Ogi is at least a few months old and the entire group hasn't gone together since Ogi and Valletta's wedding, we can conclude it's been a few months since everyone has seen each other. So this line refers to how long it's been since the wedding. The other is the meta reference. This is the first story in a post-Zero Requiem world despite the anime ending over a decade ago. Wait, did I say over a decade? Man, it really has been a while. Number 69. Everyone at the second Zero Cafe opening party. During the celebration, we get a character parade consisting of just about everyone from the original series. Here's the roll call. First, we see Colin and Tamaki, then a bunch of people from the distance. Going from left to right, we have Gino, Saeko, Rakshada, Nagisa, Toto, Ogi, Hangu, Zao, Fleta, Naoto, Kento, Ayami, Minase, and Hinata. And then from the back, we can see Minami, Kaguya, and Tianzi sitting at a table. And finally, towards the end of the scene, we can see the Indian engineers who worked with Rakshada. I'm actually impressed with this film's excuse to show us as many characters as possible, and it was a great way to start the film. Number 68, Naoto, Ogi. During the same celebration scene, you can see Valletta holding the adorable baby. Naoto shares the same name of Colin's brother and Ogi's best friend growing up. Naoto, of course, died before the start of Kogias, and this was Ogi's way of honoring him. This scene naturally follows the ending of glorification where Valletta was pregnant. So we finally learned the truth, and it's horrible. Naoto inherited his looks from Ogi. Oh well. Number 67. Naoto's Toys. We're not done talking about Naoto because he has interesting toys that are on the table during this scene. The first one is the Gurren Mark II. Colin fought using this Nightmare Frame model until turn 6 when Rakshada upgraded it to the flight enabled version. And the other toy is Tabachi. At least, I think that's how it's pronounced. The costume that Colin wears in turn 5 and appears again in turn 23 on Hori Island during that montage scene. Given who Naoto was named after, I guess it makes sense to have Colin related stuff as toys. Just wondering though, who manufactures this stuff? Is it the same guy who made the Lancelot costume? Number 66. Gino and Colin. During the party, Colin notes, That's so strange seeing them like this. And immediately afterwards, Gino walks up to Colin and says, Ah, the spoils of peace. Refreshing having all of us together like this, no? Never thought I'd live to see the day. Now, showing Colin and Gino together could be a reference to how the two of them interacted often in R2 during Colin's captivity. The romantic feelings were not mutual, where Gino wanted to get into Colin's Gurren, but she's like, bro, no, only Zero has access, so keep your Tristan power down. They are obviously not a couple here, but hey, maybe in the future, since in this timeline, well, you know, Lelouch is with C2. Number 65, Ogi the failed Prime Minister. At the end of R2, Ogi became Prime Minister of the United States of Japan. During the party, Kage asked Ogi why this was no longer the case. Well, according to Tamaki, 
call him apathetic. He just wasn't cut out for it, you know? Being one of the brass takes brass. Not his area of expertise. But really, though, is anyone surprised by this? Anyways, if you're wondering how it went with Ogi as Prime Minister, well, as he do send the Keiwa Naita. It was bad. It was completely bad. Number 64, Shinkei's Fate. Remember Shinkei, the Chinese warrior guy from R2? The person that has Lelouch's intelligence and Zaku's flying ability? The pilot of the Shen Hu? And who had a brother-sister relationship with Empress Tianzi? And nothing else? Well, we learn about his fate in this scene. Early on in R2, Shinkei is shown to be frequently coughing blood. I have no idea what illness he had, since it was never stated. All we know is that it was so bad that he believed that his time was running out. The weird part is, at the end of final turn, Shinkei is with Lelouch's other prisoners, headed towards execution. The only clue about Shinkei's fate is his absence in the original photo of Ogi's wedding, where we see Tianzi, Zhao, and Hangu, but no Shinkei. Well, this film confirms that Shinkei succumbed to his illness. It must have happened shortly after the Zero Requiem. There's a memorial slideshow on the wall honoring the characters that have died in the original series in the Zero Cafe scene. It's a 1x3 grid with the following characters that are cycled. In column 1, we have Taizo, Senba, and Asahina. <laughs> Column 2 we have Rolo Shinkei and the original Zero, which I assume is referring to Lelouch. And finally in Column 3 we have Naomi, Yoshita, and Oribe. I'm glad that the film confirms Shinkei's death. Very poor choice of words. <laughs> but why wasn't there a funeral scene, or at least a picture of Tianzi, Zhao, and Hungu visiting his grave? Heck, no one even mentions it during the party or at any other time in the film. You couldn't have had a throwaway line like, man, it's a shame that Shinkei isn't alive to see this, or something like that. This was a lazy and insulting way for the film to pay respect for Shinkei. An everlasting promise. For all time. Is this all right for you? Uh, it's just... I shall protect you in the future as well. Until the very end of time. It's so strange. I'm so happy. <laughs> Number 63, Colin's hair. During Resurrection, you might have noticed something odd about Colin, especially her hair. In the original series, Colin had two distinct hairstyles, the spiky one, which he had as a Black Knight, and the more simple, strain-out version when she played the role as a docile student. In the film, Colin's got a new look now, with much longer hair, and this new style combines both of her previous styles. Now she has spiky and straight hair in the back, which in my mind shows that Colin has accepted accepted both versions of herself as two sides of the same whole. At least I think that's what they were going for here, or maybe it was just time for a change and I'm overanalyzing stuff. I should also point out that Colin's hairstyle changed throughout the film, and she still wears that red headscarf. Of all the hairstyles, this one's my favorite, and I appreciate the level of detail here. Number 62, Winter Clothes. During the recap of what happened since the Zero Requiem, known as the Koa period, or the Miraculous Tomorrow, we see Cecile, Lloyd, and Claudio traveling together. Oh, if you forgot who Claudio is? Well, he's the only surviving member of Dalton's adoptive sons. He's a badass with only two appearances in the film, with this being the first one. In this scene, we see the debris of a heavy cargo plane, an airship Britannia once used in the Air Force. But my favorite reference 
is Cecile and Lloyd's clothes. For those that watch Transgression, you can immediately recognize them. In that scene where Cecile and Lloyd recap the events of what happened in Chinese Federation, you can see them wearing the exact same outfits, minus Cecile's adorable hat. The scene itself is hilarious with Lloyd sneezing, which is what he also did in that scene in Transgression when he was wearing the same clothing. I'm glad Resurrection rewarded people for watching those recap films with this awesome reference. Number 61. Britannia's fate. So during the meeting between Nully and the press, she states that her power is limited in the new Principality of Britannia. During the Koa period, Britannia became a democratic principality. English mother do you speak it? You see this knife? I'm gonna teach you to speak English with this knife! So anyways... It is heavily implied that the nation is smaller in size, with many of its areas becoming independent. Schneisel became the first prince of this new nation, but just being in the royal family doesn't guarantee any real power, which is in line with what Nully said. There are plenty of things to go further on in this area, but at a base level, that's what happened to Britannia, if you were wondering. Number 60. Nightmare Frames. Nightmare Frames everywhere. During the press conference, Zilkstan forces disguised as terrorists attacked. To combat them, Suzaku pilots the Maharoba, a ceremonial version of the Shinkiro, which Gino trashed in turn 24 for those that forgot. The terrorists use so many different Nightmare Frame models from both the original anime and the extended universe. First we see a Gloucester, a Gekka, and a Glasgow. Then we can see a Gun Ru, a Chinese Nightmare Frame, followed by two Panzer Hummels, the EU's mass-produced Nightmare Frame. Then a Spider Nightmare Frame, which kind of reminds of an Alexander, but obviously isn't. And they are followed by a Sutherland with a Lance, a Borai, and last but not least, we see two interesting Nightmare Frames. The first is a Gurren Mark I, which was Rockshot's first version of the Gurren Mark II. Kind of makes sense, you know, Mark I, Mark II. Anyways, that model, the MK1, was also used to produce the Byakugan, which is Orpheus' Nightmare Frame from Oz of the Reflection. And the other Nightmare Frame is the Estrella, which was used by the resistance group called the Star of Madrid in Area 24, which used to be called Spain. That's also another Oz of the Reflection reference here. In this shot of the Zilkstan forces capturing Nunnally, we can see the Estrella, a Sutherland, a Gloucester, and a Kotsky, the Nagi Shumane, and this strange looking Sutherland, which is called the Sutherland Eye. A different version of this nightmare frame was piloted by Sokika, one of the Glinda Knights. Look at that, another Oz of the Reflection reference. Forget about Z other capture, instead adapt this manga. If you're curious how Zilkstan even developed these nightmare frames, well it's stated in the film that their main resource is war, so it makes sense they could produce different types of nightmare frames. Just like the cafe scene, this was also a good way to show off many of the nightmare frames from the past. Number 59. Sandboards. During the battle against the Nightmare Frames, Suzaku wished he had a sandboard. I'd really use a sandboard. Which is a device used by ground Nightmare Frames to travel on rough terrain like the desert in Zilkstan. Suzaku actually used sandboards on the Lancelot during the Battle of Narita. Don't feel bad if you forgot what sandboards are because I did also. Number 58. Lelouch, the carriage driver. After Zilx then takes Suzaku and Nully as hostages, the story then switches to C2 and Lelouch. Lelouch in this scene is wearing an interesting outfit which includes a poncho and a familiar hat. In fact, it's the same hat worn by the carriage driver at the end of R2. The driver also wore a poncho, but it had a different color than Lelouch's. For those who are unaware, shortly after the events of R2, people speculated that the cart driver was Lelouch since C2 says the following. <laughs> I think maybe that's not quite correct. Right? Lelouch? But the writers since then have confirmed that Lelouch in fact did die at the end of R2 and we even see more proof of this in the R2 recap film about the Zero Requiem. So this scene here simply pays homage to the whole theory that Lelouch didn't die at the end of R2. Number 57. C2's Outfit C2 is wearing the same outfit that she does at the end of Glorification. And if you're wondering, it's a different outfit from what she wore while riding the carriage to end R2. Yep, that's all. Let's move on to the next one. Number 56. Broken Relics 
of the past and money? C2 drives a truck with Volusia in the back as they travel to Zilkstan. You may remember that C2 also drove a truck in R2 Turn 10 after the Black Knight kidnapped Tianzi during her wedding. Also, C2 traveled in a truck to start R1 and Lelouch of course fell into it. Anyways, during the trip we see remains of broken Sutherlands. There are many visible ones in the mechanic shop. Now, in her attempt to pay for repairs, C2 tries to use Britannian dollars, and apparently it's not enough. I don't recall ever seeing this currency in the original series, and I wonder if Britannia's recent changes devalued the money in the first place. After the mechanic scene, we then pan to a sunken ship, which reminds me of the same type of ship Lelouch destroyed in Turn 7. Number 55, The Train. C2 and Lelouch travel by train on their way to Zilkstan. In the original series, they traveled by train to and from Narita when they were dealing with Mao. Obviously, this is not the same train. This is also the second time Lelouch traveled on a train with someone after his mind was messed up due to Gios. The first was as Julius Kingsley and Aki Toli exiled, and I like the parallels here between those two incidents. Number 54, A Broken Gate. During the montage scene, we see a gate to Sea's world that's in pieces. Judging by the damage, this gate might predate the others we saw when Charles started the Ragnarok connection, or perhaps this is one of the gates on Charles Motter shown in turn 20. This could be the case, as there was one shown in the Middle East, which is close to Zilkstan's location. So it's likely this gate is the same one in turn 20, but we don't know for sure. It's a good thing that the Amaru gate, which belonged to the Farloff faction, wasn't active at this time, otherwise it might have been destroyed during the Ragnarok connection, like the other gates C2 inspected. Number 53, more trains. And you thought we were done with trains. Nope, nope, nope. See, there's an armor train carrying nightmare frames and weapons that we see several times in the film. Well, the EU used a similar armory train in Akito the Exile. Wait a minute, those aren't trains. Damn it, this is what happens when you write the script before watching the anime. Well, anyways, at least Britannia used trains like this. Here's an example from Stage 2. Okay. That's what I want to say about the trains. I promise we're done with them. Number 52. Millie, the reporter. In case you forgot, Millie became a reporter in R2 turn 12 after graduating Ashford Academy and continues to be one a year later. Oh, and she's gorgeous in that outfit. Or just in general. Sorry, I got distracted. Let's move on. Number 51. A new cheese coon. Throughout Resurrection, C2 travels with cheese coon but this one is different from the one in the original series. It has longer arms and doesn't have quite the same accessories as the original Cheese Coon. Regardless, it's adorable how Lelouch uses it for comfort, much like C2 did originally. It goes to show that no matter where C2 goes, Cheese Coon, or some version of Cheese Coon, will never be far behind. Number 50, C2 and Lelouch's love for each other. I have seen people recently notice the parallels between Lelouch and C2 taking care of one another during their worst moments. In C2's case, it's when she reverted back to her slave form and Lelouch when he lost his mind in C's world. Now, of the two, C2 arguably had a harder job and her devotion to Lelouch is commendable. This is one of the many reasons why I love this couple. Number 49, Zilkstan Gateway Locations. While Lelouch is sleeping, C2 looks at a digital map pinch zooming in an area in the Middle East, and we can see several X spots indicating possible gates that have failed. Like I said before, many of them could have been destroyed before Charles even started prepping for the Ragnarok connection. C2 zooms into an area where I assume Zilkstan is located, and it happens to be in India, which would explain why Rakshata wanted to go. She is from India, after all, and told Schneisel that she had knowledge of the area. I like when this story showcases the geography of the world, and this was a great example. Number 48. Rough as ever, I see. During the fight outside of the hotel, C2 and Colin reunite with both characters pointing their weapons at each other. C2 says, Hey Colin, rough as ever I see, and in more ways than one. Which probably referenced the times in the past where Colin acted rough, like when she defeated her in Nightmare Frame Combat. Colin called C2, Pizza Girl, which is a reference to many times where Colin expresses her annoyance over C2's obsession with pizza. Number 47. We need 
proper evidence. Lloyd and Colin explain why they were sent to Zilkstan in secret because of a diplomatic issue that a formal intervention would have caused. Colin specifically said that a lack of evidence could cause problems. Is the movie referencing Schneisel's failure from turn 19? I think so. Number 46. Seat 2. The Bullet Sponge. Swalio, Sally, Shally, I, I don't know. Anyways, he shoots C2 in the head, something C2 is unfortunately quite familiar with. This occurred in R1 Stage 1 and in R2 Turn 1. Suffice to say, just like Colin's fan service, C2 always gets shot up by people, whether it be Mao or Bittel's men. Poor girl. Number 45. Colin and Saiko kicking ass. During the battle, Saiko throws a chaos mine at the troops, which is a reference to the chaos mines that the Nightmare Frames used in the early episodes of R1. And Colin attacked the soldiers with her patented flips, which is something she did in turn one. Both characters are so badass that obviously I had to include this reference. Number 44. I believe the word is dead. C2 awakens from a bullet to the head, which obviously shocks Swally. And the two have a familiar conversation. You... But you were... I believe the word is dead. In stage 5, Lelouch and C2 had a similar conversation. That's not what I meant. Why aren't you supposed to be dead? <laughs> Lelouch also told the same thing to Clovis when they reunited. Lelouch? B but I that thought- That I was dead? You were wrong. When Sally tried to use Gios on C2, it doesn't work, which is a reference to Lelouch trying it on C2, and just like in that case, she also does a fake out here. Number 43. I made a promise. While in the truck, C2 explains why Lelouch ended up in this state. Colin, in rage, pulls out the same pocket knife as the one we see in Stage 3 and at other times in the series. She also points it at Lelouch again, and I love his expression here. Anyways, C2 explains that she made a promise. We have our contract. I promise to stay with you. Till the very end. Oddly enough, C2 wondered at the end of glorification if she would have to wait for Lelouch to keep his promise. But that never gets brought up in the film. It makes no sense and it's confusing. But at least she kept her promise. Number 42. The Magical Mask Returns In R2, Saiko served as Lelouch's double so he could be in the Chinese Federation and attend Ashford Academy at the same time. To accomplish this, she used a mass system that made her face appear as Lelouch's. And we again see her use that same mask in this scene. And it even looks like they have a bodysuit as well. There's still no explanation for how the mask works or where it came from. But hey, a reference is a reference. Number 41. Lots of drugs. During the scene where Lelouch, Colin, and C2 are prepped for the transfer to the prison, we get this funny scene. What's this story? <laughs> that one brain's been fried by drug. I assume that they are referencing Refrain, the drug that was a major problem in the original series. And ironically, Lelouch almost took it in turn 7, so saying that he fried his brains as a cover-up actually makes sense. Number 40. The Straight Jacket's Return We can't have a Code Geass story if at least one character is not in a straight jacket, so let's put everybody in a straight jacket in honor of the time that each of them wore one in the original series. In fact, let's even make them look cooler than they were as well. Also, this scene is adorable. That is all. Number 39, Lady Lelouch. In the Japanese dub, one of the prisoners asked, if the person in the middle between C2 and Colin was a guy, that person being Lelouch. There is a running joke in the picture dramas about Lelouch looking good as a girl that started with the cross-dressing picture drama and continued to the exotic dancer picture drama. Even Screen Rant accidentally made this point. Jeremiah decided to serve Lelouch upon the realization that Lelouch is the daughter of... Lelouch is the daughter of... What? Lelouch is the daughter? Oh my god. Of all the things to reference, Resurrection even remembered this gem. Number 38. The Shadow People Revealed During the scene where Lelouch reclaims his mind from Seas World, we see many shadows of familiar characters all reaching out to help out Lelouch. 
And after doing some research, I have concluded that the shadows are the souls of the people that died supporting Lelouch. Let's go over who they are. First, we see Yuffie. That's an easy one. Then Rollo. Also easy. Then Urabe. His hair gives it away. The next person is obviously Senba, since the shadow shares his overweight figure. Next, we see Yoshita, since the shadow shares his same hairstyle. Then Naomi, because who could ever forget that rear end? Then the heads of Kyoto. Remember, they were executed after the Black Rebellion. The first guy is definitely Taizo, given his bald head. It is easy to see that the shadow on the left is Hidenobu, but I can't figure out the identities of the ones on the right. All I know is each one can either be Tosai or Tatsunori. But then we get to the last person, which no one really knows for sure who it is. I think it's Maribel for the following reasons. She shares the same hairstyle as the shadow. The shadow also appears to have a sword or it could be legs, I'm not sure which. And the outfit looks like a Britannian wardrobe. Also, Maribel did work for Lelouch during the Zero Requiem, so it makes sense that she could be one of the people reaching out for him. Other possible identities that I have heard could be Naoto, Shinkei, or someone in the royal family. I'm curious if you have a different theory on the last shadow's identity. And of course, the last person's Charles. Didn't really have to say that, but there you go. You now know all the shadow identities in that scene. Number 37, I command all of you to die. Right now, Code Geass repeats the same scene for the second time. At the start of R1, Lelouch received Geass, then commanded the Britannian soldiers to kill themselves. He did the same at the start of R2 after reclaiming his memories, and in this scene after reclaiming his mind. He used the Geass on the Zilkstan soldiers to kill themselves. In the dub, he says to kill themselves instead of dying like in the other two. I, Lelouch v. Britannia, command you, now all of you. Die! I, Lelouch v. Britannia, command you! All of you! Die! Lelouch v. Britannia commands you to kill yourself right here. Right now! Not sure why there was a word change, but the takeaway is Lelouch always has to command people to die that threaten him or C2. This brings up another interesting reference. In all three instances of this scene, the enemy soldiers shoot C2, usually in the head. Number 36, Naita. After his resurrection, Lelouch discusses C2 protecting him, just like she did in Naita. In that scene, she blocked the fallout from Zaku, firing the various everywhere. Lelouch says the following. You put your body on the line for me again, just like you did before at Naita. Get away now! C2! <laughs> Even though you can't die, that doesn't mean that your pain is any less of a sacrifice. Where'd this idiot come from? If you remember in stage 11, Lelouch thanks C2 in that cave for saving his life. So in a way, he's doing it again. But I thought he said he was only going to say this once. Number 35. Colin's Humiliation. After Bitil defeats Colin in hand-to-hand -hand combat in a very brutal way, we see her tied on a stretcher. Colin experienced this before in R2 Turn 11, which was way worse than this scene. I'm not sure why they chose to reference this terrible moment from the original series, but here we are. At least here they don't emphasize her bust. But Bitil and his men say the following. We have a special plan for the lady? Oh, normally I'd let you have fun with her until I was through. But no, her, she'll be a gift. I take it back. This was worse than turn 11. I don't even know what they meant by a gift, and thank God we never find out. Number 34, Reverse Nully and Lelouch. I could bring this up at any time, so now seems like a good time. Shalio and Shamna are quite similar to Nully and Lelouch, as both Shalio and Nully are crippled, and Lelouch and Shamla have Gios power. Shalio and Nelly also share a similar handicap, but Shalio's blindness wasn't caused by Gios. The film reversed the situation since Shalio, the handicapped brother, protected Shamna, unlike Lelouch, who protected his handicapped sister. They obviously wanted to create this parallel on purpose, and it was quite effective. Number 33, Running Out of Ideas. R2 had a soft reboot for the first four episodes. At the start of R2, Lelouch devised a plan to kill Kolaris by using the building as a weapon. By taking advantage of the only entrance and exit to the Babylon Tower, Lelouch could cause the building to land on Kolaris and his men. Well, a similar thing occurs here. 
The prison also has the same type of entrance and even from a distance looks like the Babylon Tower. The difference here is that Lelouch kills Forgnar in the prison with Securidite. He forced him into the building instead of collapsing it on him. Using Securidite in general is a reference to the many times in the series where Lelouch used it as an important key part of his plan. I like the callback, but like the scene where Lelouch commanded the soldiers to die, this was too much on the nose with the nostalgia. Number 32. What's with Lelouch? Since Lelouch's resurrection, people weren't sure what he was. He's not a true immortal since Gias does work on him, but he does have immortality. From the research I have done, I have concluded that he is a failed one which is someone who didn't properly inherit a code, but also has a Gias. The concept was first introduced in Reign of Darkness as a way to describe Dash. Since then, Shamna and Lelouch are the only other failed ones that we know about. As a failed one, Lelouch's Gias works differently. The first thing you probably noticed was the new Gias animation. Shamna's Gias also had the same animation with an addition of the Gias symbol appearing at the end. This wasn't actually just an update as Swaley's Gias used the old animation. Thus, this animation is what the Gias power looks like for failed one. This wasn't actually the first time we have seen a new animation for Gias because if you remember in Akito the Exile, Layla had one as well. Looking beyond the animation, with this new Gias power, Lelouch can release people from the Gias, he can also turn it off and on, and no longer required the Gias contact lenses. I don't know if this is related or not, but Colin noted that Lelouch seemed different from before. This might have something to do with being a failed one as well. I like how they brought the concept of failed one, but they really did offer any new explanations, which was kind of disappointing. Number 31. Do you have to use such theatrics? When Lelouch puts on the new Zero costume, C2 looks annoyed. In the original anime, Lelouch's theatrics annoyed C2 and often she would note how it was very impractical. A nice little detail in this scene that I appreciated and probably something that most of you didn't notice because it happened so fast. Number 30. The new Zero costume. When reclaiming the title of Zero, Lelouch puts on a brand new Zero costume. It resembles the old one with some nice additions. The back resembles Suzaku's attire when he was the Knight of Zero. There's a green gem that hangs from the costume which came from Lelouch's Emperor's hat. And even the helmet seems to have gone through some changes. These new details are important because it shows that this Zero is not the same as before. Lelouch even states that while putting on the suit. And while putting on the suit, we get that Simpsons moment. Say the line! Lelouch! The only ones who should kill are those who are prepared to be killed. Yeah! Love this part, and this is Lelouch's most famous quote. Number 29. Cornelia's gun. Cornelia points the same gun at Lelouch that she used in the original series. Number 28. Ogie sucks. Turn 19 is the worst episode ever, and one day I will tell you the whole reason why. For now, let's focus on Ogi, who references the Black Knight's betrayal twice in this movie. The first is when Lelouch seeks Cornelia's help, and Ogi says the following. I'm not so sure about Lelouch, but I'll put my faith in Zero. Ogi. I doubted him once, and it didn't go well for me. If I could do it all over again, I'd trust him. This scene is kind of weird as in a new film series, Ogi didn't agree to give up Lelouch for Japan. In glorification, Ogi first confronts Lelouch as a way to make him more sympathetic in the scene, but these ideas were communicated horribly. Ogi's response would have made more sense in the original timeline, but Ogi did find out about the Zero Requiem, so I'm not sure what's going on here. Editor Chops here. To clarify, Ogi is implying that by not trusting Lelouch, it led to his downfall. But the purpose behind the Zero Requiem wasn't revenge against those who wronged Lelouch. Lelouch purposely united the whole world against him, including the Black Knights. The biggest example was during the UFN scene. So Ogi not trusting Lelouch was actually part of the plan. Sure, Ogi nearly died, but that wasn't out of prejudice. I don't think Lelouch would have allowed Ogi to join him anyways. I agree with the statement that Ogi should have trusted Zero in context to the Black Knight betrayal, but the rest of the stuff makes no sense when you consider the Zero Requiem as a whole. This apology for Turn 19 was horrible, and what they should have done was actually put effort to fix Turn 19 in glorification instead of their half-assed attempt at it. Even worse than this is the second reference to Turn 19 when Ogi attempts to kill himself to atone for his actions during the betrayal. Thank you, Zero. I... Uh... 
Japan wouldn't be what it is today without you. Please, consider this my apology. Stop. Ogi almost does this despite just starting a family. And what's even more frustrating is I hate how Lelouch doesn't take any responsibility for what happened, implying it was all Ogi's fault. I hate the betrayal in Turn 19 like the rest of you, but now that everyone knows everything, Lelouch did awful things and should have apologized, but the scene just pins it all on Ogi. Anyways, I'm glad the movie reminded me that Turn 19 was a thing. Thanks a lot, guys. Number 27. Orange Boy. Jeremiah and Anya show up during the party to celebrate Cornelia agreeing to work with Lelouch. Jeremiah brings oranges from his farm. At the end of R2, Jeremiah works at an orange farm while also raising Anya as a pseudo-adoptive father. As we know, the incident with Suzaku's execution led to the nickname of Orange Boy, which is something Jeremiah carries until this day. A bit on the nose, but still a great reference. Number 26. Cecile's Cooking. During the party, Lloyd drinks Cecile's new recipe, which almost kills him in a hilarious scene. I mean, just listen to the ingredients list. I added in a dragon's breath chili and a splash of orange liqueur and a dash of cornstarch to give it body. It certainly has a unique smell. That's the fresh durian zest. Cecile, as you guys probably know, loves to cook very strange things. And there's been so many scenes where Lloyd suffers from eating these Let's call them unique recipes. Obviously, I had to include any fun references to the better C2, Cecile Crumi. Number 25. We haven't used this signal since Stage 6. In Stage 6, Lelouch used a signal to let Suzaku know that they should meet on the school's roof. During their conversation, Suzaku revealed that they haven't used that signal since they were children. Flash forward to Resurrection, and Lelouch used that same signal to tell Suzaku they wanted to meet in private. A nice callback referencing Lelouch and Suzaku's friendship. Number 24. Valletta's Wedding. Sit back and relax, because going through all the characters and references that occurred during this wedding is going to take a while. In the first scene, we see Kanto, Ogi, and Valletta as the new married couple cuts the really large wedding cake. Seriously, why is this so big? Is someone hiding in there? Anyways, in the next scene, we see Nagisa and Toto possibly dating, but probably not. Next, Lloyd and Rakshada are dancing while intoxicated and express their thoughts on the marriage in a funny moment. Cecile is not far behind them, also intoxicated, trying to get them away. This isn't the first time, by the way, that Cecile drinks in a series, and I'm pretty sure she gets tipsy all the time. This was even referenced in the new summer event in Lost Stories. Anyways, Nina then appears to apologize for their behavior. Once those fools get out of the way, we can then see everyone sitting at the tables. We see Suzaku as Zero petting Arthur on his lap, Next to him is Hongu, Zhao, Shinke is in present, so he must have died before this happened, and Gino is the last person at the table. We also see Colin and Kento, together with Rivals, Shirley, and the three pilots of the Ikaruga, Ayame, Minasa, and Hinata. Mia, the girl famous for having the largest bust in Kogias, is sitting with them as well, and Guilford is sitting with Cornelia at a separate table, because of course he is. In the next scene, we see several characters together to take a picture, including Ayame, Minasa, Hinata, Colin, Toto, Nagisa, and Gino. But we also see Claudio. My favorite part about this scene here is the conversation between Toto and Nagisa. Well, really, it's just Toto talking and Nagisa responds to it. It's a good thing for a man to settle down. Matrimony builds character. Man, Nagisa is so pissed, you can hear her go, mm. <laughs> In case you guys don't know, one of the ongoing side plots is Nagisa's inability to confess her love to Toto and Toto's inability to realize Nagisa's feelings. I think he recognized her feelings at the end of the film, but we'll get to that later. In the next scene, we see Schneider commenting on Cornelia's possible marriage in the future, which embarrasses her. This references that awkward scene where Schneisel embarrassed Cornelia in stage 21. You know, the one I made a whole video about? Oh, and Jeremiah and Anya are together here, and Anya is adorable in that dress. The camera then zooms and slides very quickly to the right, but if you slow it down, you can see Guilford, then Colin and Kento talking with Mia. Not sure why Kento is doing that. What do you guys think? Then we see a fleet of the prodigal children running past the camera, led by Rakshada's sister. Shanti. Kind of creepy that Mimi's watching them, but whatever, you already know. I think it's a miracle the cameraman survived all that. Then the camera shows Ogi and Valletta at the main table, and we get possibly the most irritating.
exciting thing in the world. A scene with both Tamaki and Rivals, and unlike the scene in stage 25 or stage 24, both of them act like idiots at the same time, proving why I can't stand either. You look so nice, I can't believe it. You're a real life Cinderella story. Uh, what is wrong with you? Just let her enjoy her special day. <laughs> real talk though, you guys can afford a way bigger party than this, right? 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 Thank God Shirley stops Ribbles, and I hope to God we don't see this stuff ever again because I don't think the world can handle this much stupidity in one scene. Anyways, after that insanity, we see Cannon with the Glinda Knights. For those that don't know, the Glinda Knights are a unit similar to the Knights of the Round introduced in Oz of the Reflection. There's so much more to say, but this video is already too long, so let's stick to the roll call. From left to right is Knotted, the former Knight of Nine, and now she's in Lost Stories. Next is Sokika, followed by Aldred, which I confused for Marika in my top Beautiful Woman in Code Geass video, but this time I got it right. Her new hairstyle is a bit different, which is why I got it wrong originally. In the back is Oegros, Aldrin's uncle. Next to him is Leonard. He's putting his hands on his wife, Marika Sorosi. That's the same girl who Colin killed in this scene, but was retconned to have survived thanks to Leonard. And the last guy is Tink. I like how Cannon says, I don't believe we've had the pleasure, implying that the audience probably doesn't know who these people are. Hint, hint, guys, adapt this manga already. In the last scene from the wedding, we see Saiko, Nully, Kaguya, Tianzi, and Margaret, who is the new leader of the EU, introduced in the miraculous birthday picture drama. Then, Millie, Nina, and Guilford enter the picture. By the way, everyone at the wedding wears the same outfits as in that original picture to preserve the continuity. And that's all the references in that wedding. I gotta give them credit, they sure crammed a bunch of stuff into one scene, and now you know them all. Number 23, the nude scene. When Shamla's Gias activates, it sends her back six hours in the past where she was enjoying a nice bath while everyone was watching. Kinda awkward, don't you think, especially since Shalio was there? I, I don't know. Kokias loves its nude scenes, and of course, we had to get one here. This one is for the least horniest of all Kogias fans. And since we're here to honor Colin's fan service, we get scenes that really show her good sides, if you know what I mean. Number 22, Copycat. During the early part of the movie, Shalio explains to Suzaku that he studied his moves. And this is shown during their battle towards the end of the film, where Shalio used a Spinzaku kick against Suzaku. While we're here, let's talk about Spinzaku. Suzaku uses a unique spin kick when fighting either in hand-to-hand -hand or in nightmare frame combat. The film itself referenced the kick early on, and we see it again here. I guess Suzaku didn't like the taste of his own medicine. Number 21, Cecile's outfit. During the operation to save Nully, Cecile rocks a new uniform similar to the one she wore in stage 25. Both have a similar yellow color that shows off her assets. You guys know how I feel about Cecile, so this shouldn't be a surprise. Number 20, C2 and the Luge are back together again. There are multiple timelines that Shamna creates after each use of her Gia's power. In the first timeline, C2 was piloting to get Koi by herself and used it to get to Lelouch during his encounter with Shamna. After Shamna used her Gias, C2 rescued Lelouch using the get Koi, and the two ride together as they did in the Gwain. C2 and Lelouch had so many awesome memories in the Gwain, including their first kiss, which is why I like seeing them together in a nightmare frame once again. Number 19. The Gurin's arm. During the battle against Bittel, Colin sacrificed her arm to stop Bittel, which didn't work. But this is a reference to something that happens to every nightmare frame that Colin pilots. Did you know that every nightmare frame that Colin pilots loses one of its arms? The only exception to this rule is the Gurin flight enabled version. In stage one, she ejected the left arm to get away from Jeremiah, which worked. In stage 9, a night police destroyed her Borai's right arm. In stage 11, the Gurren's right arm is badly damaged by Zaku after it blocked a shot from the Varus cannon. In stage 24, Zaku destroys the entire right arm and does it again in turn 6. In final turn, Zaku destroys the right arm with the Slash Harkin in the last part of their battle. Actually, in that scene, both arms were destroyed, but you get the point. And now we have this scene in Resurrection. In short, any Nightmare Frame that Colin pilots has a very good chance of losing an arm. I'm sure with this in mind, Rockshada holds her breath each time Colin goes out for a mission. At least the Gurren type special didn't lose an arm. Number 18, Mao's Return. When Lelouch starts coming up with possible abilities for the Gios power, 
the first idea is a mind reader. I'm assuming that Lelouch thought about that because of Mao. If that's the case, that's kind of weird since Mao doesn't exist in his timeline. Either way, it's interesting to use that as the first possible Gias ability for Shamna. Number 17, turn 19, another reference. During the battle, Schneisel arrives on the ship with the same shuttle he used when landing on the Ikaruga. Seriously, stop with the turn 19 references already. On a positive note, it was nice to see more scenes of Schneisel and Cannon working together. Number 16, Orange Boy, again. Jeremiah Gutwall pilots an interesting looking Sutherland, appropriately named the Sutherland Loyal. I guess they never rebuild it a Siegfried after that battle against Anya. Its design has great references. The face looks like Jeremiah, with one half having the same cyborg look. On the chest of the Nightmare Frame, you can see the orange logo on it, which is a reference to Jeremiah working on an orange farm. That might even be the logo of said farm if it has one. The orange logo also references his nickname, Orange Boy. The impressive beam from the Sutherland is also orange. I guess orange really was the name of his loyalty. Number 15. Reflection Gias. During their final confrontation, Lelouch used Gias on Shanna to make her fall asleep. Lelouch learned early on that his Gias can be reflected, something he took advantage of during his confrontation with Mao in stage 16. Lelouch would take advantage of this again and reflected Gias onto Shamna during this scene. I believe that Shamna opened her eyes and attempted to avoid direct eye contact, thinking she'd be safe from Lelouch's Gias. But she had another thing coming. A great way to reference one of the ways Lelouch can use his Gias. Number 14. The Lancelot Sin and the Gurren type special reveal. During the operation to save Nully, Colin battles Bittle while Suzaku battles Shalio. Colin and Suzaku were using frame coats to cover their new models. During this sequence, I knew those frame coats wouldn't stay on forever, and I was right. As a last resort, Colin and Suzaku both ejected their frame coats, revealing their new nightmare frames, the Lancelot Sin and the Gurren type special. These are the upgraded versions of the Lancelot Albion and the Gurren Satan 8 elements. After the reveal, Suzaku assumed his patented Lancelot pose and the final battle started. And Suzaku's eyes lit up, indicating that the Gias command to live is still active. An awesome moment for sure, especially if you saw this film in theaters. Number 13. Once again, I owe my life to you. Lelouch enters C's role to save Nully. When he finally gets there, a bunch of souls nearby try to consume him and Nully. That is, until a few select souls save Lelouch and Nully, transporting them with a rainbow elevator. During this scene, Lelouch looks to the audience and says, Would you look at that? Once again, I owe my life to you. Some interpret this as Lelouch breaking the fourth wall by talking to the audience directly, or he's simply referring to the souls that helped him reclaim his mind earlier in the film. Which one do you guys think it is? Number 12. Lancelot. Punch! Suzaku finishes his fight with Shalio by punching the Nagi Shumane in the chest area. Suzaku used that technique against Colin in stage 23, and Colin used it against him in final turn. I'm glad that Suzaku remembered that ability. Number 11. Margaret appears again. After Shamla does... This? <laughs> there is an explosion in the temple with the Gia shards raining down on the world. During this scene, Margaret, Tianzi, and Kaya are together with Minami again serving as security. Why? I ask again why. They couldn't get anyone else? Anyways, good to see Margaret in the story. Number 10, Nully and Lelouch's closure. Lelouch and Nully have a heart-to-heart -heart talk where Nully apologizes for what happened at the end of R2. She assumed the worst that was until, of course, his fake out death. Lelouch tells C2 that he's decided to leave Nully alone so she can grow and live on her own. It's a great development because Lelouch didn't have a reason to live without Nully, but now has found one. Hint, hint, C2. I really love this scene since the two didn't have sufficient closure in the original series. Number 9. The Scar on Lelouch's Neck You might have noticed that Lelouch has a mysterious scar on his neck, and I have two theories on its origin. The first is that Charles gave it to him as he choked him right before he died. The other could be that it's a result of becoming a failed one. Or the third possibility is that when Charles choked out Lelouch, that was also when the code was transferred to Lelouch, which is where that scar came from. In a similar way that the nun gave C2 a scar when she transferred her code. He has a scar at the beginning of the film and it persists throughout. 
Remember that C2 also had a scar when she became immortal, so there could be something that occurs when someone becomes an immortal, or in this case, a failed one. The scar never healed despite Lush being a failed one, kind of like C2 scar. I'm not sure on this one. Any clarity on this would be great. Number 8. I guess some things never change. When Lush runs after C2, this happens. <sighs> Well, I guess some things never change. As you know, Lelouch has never been good at sports or really anything athletic. To be more precise, this scene references turn 5 where Lelouch runs after C2 with a similar result. I love how C2 insults him during this moment and it brings back so many wonderful memories of the two of them bantering. Number 7. You selfish creature. And speaking of bantering, before the best scene in the movie, Lelouch and C2 have one of their typical arguments where they tease each other. I love how this naturally happens despite the two characters not seeing each other for over a year. Technically, she was with Lelouch, but without his mind, it's almost like he's not there to begin with. In the original series, I don't recall if Lelouch ever called C2 a selfish woman, but he has implied similar things in their conversations. Hence why C2 said they established this already. Number 6. What if I went with L2? There's a lot to analyze with this scene, so I'm going to save that for another video. The only thing I want to draw attention to is the fact that Lelouch decided to go with L2, which is something that other immortals did as well, including C2, the first V2, the second V2, K2, and U2. Only Gigi, Charles, the Nun, Horai, and Hitigen didn't use this format. But keeping in tradition, Lelouch went with L2. One thing of note, in the Japanese dub, Lelouch says he can't use Lelouch Lamperouge anymore, and the dub he just says, I don't want to abandon my name. So, did Lelouch before this scene decide to go with Lamperouge since he abolished the aristocracy? I wonder what you guys think about this. Number 5. The Ending Images. Orange Boy. The Third Time. After Lelouch and C2 walk off into the sunset with the refugees, we see a series of still images showing what happens to the characters after the events of the film. And these images remind me of the ones we used to see at the end of each episode for R1 and R2. Now there are so many images that I'm going to break them up into a couple sections. So this first one we're going to go over Colin apologizing for breaking the frame code, and Shanti of course is not pleased. We next see Millie hanging out with Lloyd and Nina in Cecile's room as she recovers. Cecile is obviously annoyed here. If you guys forgot, Lloyd and Millie were engaged in R1 and broke it off in R2. So I assume they're just hanging out as friends, but it's nice they remain close despite breaking off the marriage. And Cecile is probably annoyed with Lloyd's antics as she has to put up with this crap since the original anime. Anya and Jeremiah are again working on the orange farm with Saiko hiding in the bushes. I will never get over Anya's beautiful smile here. Just like the end of R2, Jeremiah did end up in an orange Orange Farm, if you remember way back when, this was one of the options that Guilford presented him after he was incarcerated for letting Zero go. We next see Tianzi with Nully and Margaret, while Minami is in the back. Seriously, why do they keep doing this? Oh my god, please stop. Number 4. Toto and Nagisa. In this image, we go from something disturbing to something quite wholesome, where we see Ogi and Valletta having a double date with Toto and Nagisa. I think it's obvious at this point that Toto and Nagisa are officially a couple. I don't see a ring on their fingers, so they're probably not married. And for the love of God, that baby on Toto's back is Ogi's, not his. The hair clearly gives it away. I have no idea why anyone ever thought that. This next image is Forgnar joining the UFN. And does anyone know the name of that blonde woman who appears in this scene and, and a few others? Leave your answer in the comments. Also, remember this line from stage 23? Wow, you're really tall, aren't you? Don't worry, though. I'll catch up with you pretty soon. Well, it looks like it never happened because Kage is still short. Oh, well. Number three, Shirley. In the next image, we see Shirley crying on the phone, most likely with Alouche on the other end. She's using the same phone in high school, possibly the same color. I didn't mention Shirley in this video, so now is a good time as any. Shirley is referenced several times as the person who helped bring Lelouch's dead body to Jeremiah as part of their plan to resurrect Lelouch. C2, Jeremiah, and Shirley formed this plan during glorification, so it was nice for Shirley to finally hear Lelouch's voice, even if C2 is technically cock-blocking her. Number 2. Resurrection of Akito The last image has the biggest implications for the story going forward and hopefully the other capture. We see the Zaku as Zero with Arthur 
and there's another cat which many believe to be Eliza. Eliza is Layla's cat from Akito the Exile. If this is true, then Akito and the rest of the team did indeed go to Japan and met Suzaku and possibly other main characters. Kind of like those what if stories in Genesis RE Code. This is really encouraging for Zero Capture if we ever get it. Number one. For those who do not have the resolve. During the final scene of Resurrection, Lelouch declares out loud the consequences of receiving a Gias power, which is what C2 told him in the first episode. I believe Lelouch is saying this as the reason why they will be taking power from those who are unworthy and only granting it to those that are. Oh, and C2 and Lelouch are wearing their wedding outfits. Dark and Gothic makes sense given the context. And for staying this long in the video, here's a bonus one. During the make of this video, I actually forgot about this scene. So just like Suzaku, Lelouch's Gias command is still affecting Schneisel to this day. Normally, this would be where the outro would start, but as I was editing this video, I noticed even more references. So in quick succession and at the 11th hour, here's even more references. As Lelouch's plans fail since Shamna used her Gias, we see that familiar green overlay covering his face. Lelouch tells Shamna check which is something he told other characters in the story, and it's a reference to chess, which is one of the bases for most of the metaphors in Kogias, including many of Lelouch's tactics and strategies. Lelouch promised to make C2 smile, and keeps that promise at the end of the film. Nina wasn't able to pilot a nightmare frame in the original series, but now can as she rescues Lloyd and Cecile. When C2 points a gun at Lelouch, it is similar to the scene where she turns around in the Gwen to kiss Lelouch. This is also the second time in Code Geass where C2 points a gun at Lelouch when he doesn't do what she wants. Many of the famous songs from the original soundtrack appear in the film, but for copyright reasons, I won't be playing them. Rakshada calls Lloyd Pudding, which is a reference to their past relationship. And finally, the current year in the story is either 2018 or 2019, and the film came out in 2019. So the film basically came out in the same year the story took place in. How cool is that? There you go. That's over 70 references from Lelouch of the Resurrection. It was quite a behemoth to make, but it was well worth it and I hope you enjoyed it. Let me know in the comments below which reference was your favorite or which reference I forgot. Despite having so many in the video, I definitely missed some. If you want even more commentary on Lelouch of the Resurrection, then check out my video review. Until then, as I always like to say, the world is not a dark place and tomorrow will be a good day. Thank you so much for watching this video.